Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Previously previously here for the Gaia Complex, as well as its first expansion, um, Hardware 2119. Now coming back with its second major expansion, Evolution by Design. The one and, o the one and only, better known as Shep, Chris Shepperson. How you doing today, man? I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for inviting me back uh, again. Um, uh, it's, it's humbling to know you're not bored of me yet. Uh, it takes, it would take a lot, it would take a lot for me to get bored of anybody, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you so much for inviting me back on. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. Plus, it's all, it's always good. It's always good when I can introduce some variety to the, um, to the, cyber, to the cyberpunk genre, as, as opposed to some folk who seem, who seem to think that it should be. That it should be a bit um, samey, you know, as as if we as if we're still in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> yeah, it's and, always good to have a little variation and mix it yeah. up a little bit. Um, as, that's just a pet peeve. That's just a pet peeve of mine. I've, I've explored in the past how a lot of explorations of cyberpunk seem to begin and end with nineteen um, eighties futurism, even if it was, even if the Cyberpunk IP in question wasn't made in the 1980s. Yep. Oh. But with the, but with that said, I do remember Evolution by Design being te being teased about a year ago. There what there were um a few de a few delays here and there and now it's now it's coming back. Oh. And the I be, if I'm not mistaken, this one, it, this one, Evolution by Design, is primar is primarily built on the non-human archetypes for for the Gaia complex. Yeah, that's correct. It, it, in many ways, you could see it as sort of three mini books rolled into one. Um, we do absolutely talk about the three major non-human elements of the setting. So that's artificial intelligence. So that that covers Gaia itself, the, the over, overarching uh, nemesis of the setting, if you like, and uh, other AI developments and the police force. Um, it also covers vampires. Obviously, the Gaia complex it has a significant uh, sway towards um, the vampirism as a major part of the setting. And then also the ferals, which are of those three, the one uh, playable faction, if you like, and they are uh, a uh, human subspecies that are able to meld their minds with the animals of the metropolis and allow players to uh, curl up in a little ball somewhere and play part of their session as a as a street mongrel or a rat or uh, you know anything they can they can they can find their their hands on. So all of these three elements got. You know they've been spoken about in our other books, um, but they there was so much to say about them. We wanted to give them their own space and talk a lot more about the kind of conspiracies behind them and the motivations of those various factions. And this book is dedicated to doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, we've t we've talked we've talked quite a bit about what separates the Gaia complex from. Um, other other forms of cyberpunk, whether it be having it being se being centered in a European arcology, or the fact that it leans a significant amount more violent than than other um, cyberpunk affairs. But since Evolution by Design is focused on the on those three um, elements, I think this is as good a time as any to give a to give a bit of a to give a bit of a refresher on on them but more more importantly where the idea of having these three elements be um playable pillars came from 
Because that part I don't think we got into in the past. Uh, no, we didn't. No. So, um, uh, the, so at the moment, the only purely playable faction of the three is uh, other, other Ferals. The Ferals um, were an idea that came about uh, when I was developing the core game to add a, a little diff bit of a different spin to the way that people play games. And um, during playtesting, um, a couple of playtesters said, you know, like, what about cybernetics for animals? What about sort of brain wiring that allows players to kind of um, move their consciousness into, into you know, cybernetically enhanced animals? And it gives, like, a whole new way to kind of go about the game and playing. And over a bit of time, like, that technology made sense and there are elements um in the hardware catalog that allow you to do stuff like that if, if you're a, a non-feral but um because of the game's um meta plot if you like and the the, the the story that sits behind the game that's all kind of talked about through the fiction of the core book and the, and the supplements that follow um there was uh, a place to throw a few ideas in that paid homage to other things in popular media. And that's where the ferals came from. Um, I won't reveal too much about what those references are, because for anybody that uh, reads, chooses to read the, the books, they should hopefully be able to decode the clues that are in there and figure that out for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so vampires um, are, from the original setting, from the core book setting, or if you like the big... Well, you've got two big bad guys. One is the police force one of vampires and um since the day we launched the core book we've had people saying you know are you going to make vampires playable are you going to make vampires but we really want to play this game as vampires and i've always said no i've always said you know the same reason that you don't with some very limited exceptions from ad and d the reason you don't play a dragon in dungeons and dragon is because once you are the biggest threat the game feels very different and you lose a lot of focus so I never really wanted players to be vampires. So what this game, what this book has allowed me to do is introduce a halfway house and introduce the story of the creation of Chattel, which are uh, human enslaved thralls gifted with certain traits of the vampire species um, at the cost of losing their own free will. And not only is that in there as a kind of fiction piece, but it will also give. It also provides the rules for GMs to uh, shift their player character, their merc teams, to being um, Chattel in in the employment of a vampire syndicate, whether the players want to or not. So uh, it can be used as a way for people to to play the game completely disregarding the concept of being a working mercenary team and instead take up arms in service of one of the giant blood syndicates. Um, or it could be used as a vehicle by GMs to um, really throw a sense of oppression at the players and rip them from their their uh, neon-coated lives and throw them into something that they, they never expected to be involved in. Um and that's been really, really well received by um, you know the playtesting contingent, and um, I've had a lot of feedback about people who are quite excited to start in implementing that into their games. Um, and then the third part, the AI. Um, obviously, the police force are in the Gaia complex are an AI controlled robotic force, and an and an AI entity governs the um, the metropolis as a whole. This book talks a lot about. Um, uh, a much darker shift in the technology and development that Guy has been undergoing, supposedly for the betterment of the civilians of the metropolis, but that is a very questionable stance when you read about what's happening in the background. Um, but for player characters, what we've done is we've introduced a large number of commercially available AI services, so if players don't have the time or the skill set or the uh, desire to invest their time, resources and energy into doing specific tasks or researching specific tasks or carrying out, you know, certain functions, they can 
spend their hard-earned money on access to various AI subscription services and have those services assist their team in getting jobs done. Um, so there's a lot more interaction between player characters and AI beyond the police force coming as a result of this book as well, which is quite exciting too. Yeah. And I'm, gu- I'm guessing I'm guessing that part of the reason... You mentioned not wanting to not wanting um, people to play as dragons in something something like D and D because when you're the when you're the apex there's not there's not that much of a threat. Um, when it came to pl- when it came to playing as an a- as an AI or playing as a, or playing as a vampire or playing as a pharaoh, um, was was one of the things that you wanted to make sure that you that um it's not on too ho- too high of a pedestal above those who just want to play a, nor- a normal baseline human yeah absolutely i mean the, it was quite easy to balance uh, the feral species to um the human species mm-hmm. so when you go through character creation the general core is you pick a, a human or you pick a feral and then you follow the footsteps like that ferals come with a certain number of bonuses and then a certain number of disadvantages that counteract those bonuses um with vampires as a baseline, as your uh, major primary foe being um, significantly more powerful than even the most experienced of human mercenaries, um, allowing players to play a, a, a pure vampire, it, it was just not something I wanted to inject in the system. I didn't really just want player characters running around doing what, whatever they wanted with a set of vampire stats and abilities you know from an npc standpoint from a law standpoint the way that the vampires operate and function within the setting is that they aren't running around causing a rampage they're far more calculated and they're not just going to crop up and cause a scene in the middle of the street unless there's some kind of feeding frenzy so um you know, shying away from touching on that made a lot of sense. Um, at the moment, as a player character, the idea of playing an AI entity is something I'm really interested in evolving. And, and it was originally on my um, skeleton to include uh, the rules for doing so in Evolution by Design. But in playtesting, um, it wasn't widely liked and um, it was quite hard to balance it um for one if you make that entity uh physical and mobile you're effectively comparing it to what is one of Gaia's police officers mm. which like the vampires is is wildly more powerful than everybody else around them and if you make them more of an intelligence based entity and i'm thinking here like i'm comparing something like cortana from the halo series mm. um you know carried around on somebody's data pad um the uh depending on the style of game session that's being played depending on the games master style is that experience could be either really cool or really quite boring for the person embodying the ai entity so that's why we chose to remove or step away from the idea of people creating an ai character and instead giving human and feral characters the option to buy into AI subscription services to assist them. Um, Almost like hiring an NPC AI to work for your team. And that was far better received and far easier Mm -hmm. to balance because inevitably what you're doing is you're injecting a GM controlled entity to a degree into the player team. And um, that avoids any of the, uh, utter chaos that can come from players suddenly having, you know, significant power uh, at their fingertips. So, um, yeah, you know, balance, balance is really important to me. The game is, is a pretty brutal game when it, when it gets to to the violence level. And, um, you know, I I always have a big, strong sort of narrative first focus on, um, on the way I handle the rules. Mm -hmm. So, um, not injecting too many significantly powerful player characters is really important to me. And, and, and this balance seems to have struck it just right. Yeah. 
and the the when it's funny you mentioned Cortana because for whatever reason when it came to the idea of a of a playable AI or even a AI NPC that's help, that's helping the party out the visualization I ended up have I kept having was Legion uh, okay. from Ma from Mass Effect who you know who basically explores the fact that Geth are software that are inhabiting mobile platforms. Yep. Uh, but I'm get and I'm guessing that I'm guessing that even with AI in an N in an NPC form. The the idea of the body that the body that they're inhabiting is that something that is being addressed in evolution by design. Yeah. So um, the only AI in physical embodiment in a legal sense is the New Europe Police Force, mm -hmm. and they are akin to an army of Legion. Um, they are, I guess. Um, the closest reference would be something like Chappie from from the movie Chappie, mm -hmm. um, or a scene in Elysium, or those kind of mechanized AI controlled um, entities. And, and Legion is a good reference to that. And there are a couple of degrees of it. And Evolution by Design also include it introduces not only a uh, a flying AI controlled drone network as an addition to the police force, but also the new uh, Warden Tactical Unit, which is effectively a sort of giant AI-controlled spider tank. Mm. Um, and um, outside of the police force, there is a, um, a motion by Gaia and, and Hansa Innovations that the physical embodiment of AI services is considered illegal so that nothing can rival the police force mm -hmm. um now there are through the law and the fiction you'll find that there are other people that have been playing with that and there are um a, there are there is a low level corporation that has uh circumvented the rules slightly by uh it's the climaxum empire who basically make um uh restricted ai controlled sex dolls that are sold um through registered dealers to people with a very limited protocols of people that have trouble or don't want to liaise sexually with with humans so um and the most access to those is mostly done through sort of like uh various clubs that are sanctioned and so that the ai can be monitored that controls them so this book delves a little deeper into other people that are kind of breaching those black market uh, levels of introducing AI into physical form. And all of the subscription services are done through um, uh, hacking rigs or public access terminals. They're effectively like um, a really, really advanced version of having Siri on your phone, mm -hmm. um, except they learn your behavior. The one exception to that is uh, there's a corporation that we introduced in um, Hardware 2119 called Tarkin Industries that are uh, like a kind of gung-ho weapons manufacturer that have come in with really flashy weapons in bright colors. and they, they make decent weapons and they just deliberately make them just that tiny bit cheaper than the competition. Hmm. And um, they have developed an AI platform, the, the, the Marksman platform, which is installed directly into their firearms and it learns your trigger behavior and it activates kill cam software and all sorts of things which are officially illegal but it does it in a way that is kind of gamified and exploits legal loopholes and so there's this whole movement that's discussed in the book on the core which is our kind of version of the internet mm -hmm. um in various forums which is um this whole kind of like glorification of like um, a violence through the use of these weapons, but it's been kind of pitched to feel a bit like a bunch of people playing Fortnite or, you know, Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's really interesting. That's something that we're going to continue to this. This book has an awful lot. You can buy into the marksmanship um, 
AI service and have it installed in your weapons. And there's all rules for doing that. And it's something that you're going to, there's a, there's a bigger story related to it, which is started in this book. And then in future publications, we're hoping to um, show you uh, the results of that significant data um, uh, collection process and, and why Tarkin were looking to do that. Like there's always a darker side to the, the thing, the seeds that we plant in the guy complex. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's quite exciting, but at the moment outside of the police force, certainly walking the streets openly, there is, there are no other physical embodiments of AI. Yeah. Now, given the bullet points on the Kickstarter, I suppose the next thing I'd want to, I'd want to ask on is the, fer the feral run bar, the smoking dog, which yeah. I believe, I believe you're using that as kind of a, Kind of, kind of a hub for the subculture around around ferals with it within the Gaia complex. Yeah. Uh, so what? So what can you tell me about how how that place looks, how the feel for that kind of place, and and uh, why it, why it's a big deal to um, ferals? Sure. So we we first introduced the smoking dog in passing in the core book um we just mentioned it in the in the feral chapter about being a um a place to go and find feral freelancers in the heart of sort of merc territory and that it was run and operated by uh, a feral um called doc jones who is um well connected to some of the the major protagonists of the fiction that props up the guy complex so in Hardware 2119, we introduced, uh, we included a map of Neo Munich, which is considered the sort of part of um, player character land, like the Merc networks. It's where it has the where all the black markets are based. It's the it's the the hive of scum and villainy within the uh, within the Gaia complex, and the smoking dog sits flat bang in the middle. We you know we popped it on the map. But we didn't give it much more legs than that. So. With this book, what we've done is we've given it a, a really deep dive, um, being the central hub within the Merc network of where to find and how to connect up with, with feral freelancers. Um, we've gone deep into not only the, the, the history of the venue, but we've, we've got a really detailed, really beautifully illustrated map of of it and shown like you know what's behind closed doors it's got this huge back room that joins onto a warehouse it's got a, a boxing ring in there and the feral community use that to settle arguments and scores um and it talks about various games that ferals will play to resolve issues like where they all place their hands on a table and there's a venomous snake in the middle and they all write for control of the venomous snake um and the one that loses gets bitten and um, various, various um, characters. We talk about the security team, um, plenty of illustrations that show you, you know, the, the, the people that you'll meet at the dog, the owner and why and how it's such an important connection to the feral community. It is the home away from home with most ferals choose to live uh, free of physical attachment um many of them are are homeless or they use the cover of vagrancy as being a way to um you know conceal their um conceal the fact that they're they're feral and they you know because there's a lot of um pro human group or there's a lot of sort of uh hate towards anybody that isn't human whether that's vampires or ferals mm -hmm. and so um the dog is this like warm, open, almost twenty four seven, really old school British stroke, uh, German looking tavern. Um, you know, it's got a neon sign outside, but inside it is um, it's warm and it's cozy and it's not neon flooded like the rest of the bars. It's real old school looking. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting um, as well is it's predominantly wooden floored and wooden tabled. And this is really important because we, we lay out in the Gaia complex that wood as a resource is exceptionally rare. Almost everything today that we make out of wood 
is made out of metal or concrete or composite in in you know a hundred years from now in the setting of the guy complex and um you know they're pretty much trees aren't a thing anymore rivers have been concreted over there's not a lot of natural life underneath the atmospheric bubble of the metropolis and um wood is an exceptionally valuable resource because it is a significant weapon against vampires mm -hmm. and um there is one arms manufacturer that owns a small private spruce forest that's kept behind a 30 foot high wall so that they can if if um the now illegal anti-vampire weaponry is ever uh, allowed to be manufactured again they've got an instant resource to to make the ammunition and uh, the smoking dog is like as much as nobody would dare harm rip off a floorboard or rip off a, a chair leg it it's this everybody feels like they're in the middle of this incredible uh, armory and safe haven away from away from the vampiric threat and it's really important to point out that not all vampires are a threat there are many that have accepted the rules of uh humankind and that they live be it with an awful lot of prejudice amongst um amongst humans and ferals in the metropolis but but none are welcome at the smoking dog um and there's a there's a backstory as to why doc jones has laid down that rule and what he faced at the hands of the vampires in the past um but yeah we we go i think this may be this is probably the best part of 20 pages on the venue on the activities that han that happen there the games that are played we even include a small list of um mini games and how to play them so if like you're player characters are in the bar and they want to gamble and take place in some of the games there are some dice games you can play mm -hmm. and um and the people the regulars how much you'd expect to pay to pick up various freelancers uh with various skill sets and um yeah it's it's really cool it's it's something i've really wanted to flesh out since the core book and it's really amazing to have that opportunity to dedicate mm -hmm. um all that space to it so yeah it's yeah. been a joy to flesh out the smoking dog and i'm, I'm guessing that there's going to be a, ha a handful of um, story seeds or, or rumors within that section. Absolutely, yeah. We we there's um as I as we always do with our books, we include uh, a number of data seeds. So those are the sort of um, one page adventures for people to to take on as their own and and, and put you know for GMs to use and create and uh, expand out to be parts of their campaigns. Uh, there's a couple of those that are very centrally focused on activities at the Smoking Dog. And the the feral chapter, the section on the Smoking Dog, details a number of uh, really interesting sort of story hooks that you can pull onto either through the people or through elements of, um, you know, what happens in or around the bar. There's plenty of opportunity from this book to include the dog as a, a central hub for your games. Um in, you know, and, and roll in a lot of the the regulars and the people and the the the, the two bouncers and the, the barman and all these kind of people are all fleshed out enough to be to to become part of your ongoing story. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the blood to the blood syndicates, and th this is another thing that's been hinted at in both the in both the original book for the Gaia Complex, some of the data seeds and. Um, be and beyond about how the the various vampires are in the middle of kind of a a gang a gang war or a turf war between um, between each other. What you're referring to is the blood war, and I'm guessing yeah. with evolution by design, you're going to be exploring that a bit a bit more than just a few teases. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 definitely teased the concept of this. Um... The, the, of the blood war in the core book um there's this sort of separation between vampires who have accepted uh human life and don't feed on vampires anymore uh, but feed on humans and accept the synthetic blood source that's made for them and then you've got the other side which are, which are tagged the outsiders who are sort of pushed back into the french slums um that's sort of west of paris uh which is known as the outer fringe 
And there it is believed that there are a number of large crime syndicates that are called the blood syndicates mm-hmm. um, who effectively run blood farms and kidnap people and harvest blood from the, the wider metropolis and filter it back to their kind of gang empires. But Hardware 2119, we delved into that a little bit further and we talked about the big six um, um blood syndicates and who they were uh who led them and what their kind of politics looked like um so that we could talk about blood as a black market currency so what we've done with evolution by design is we've delved a lot deeper into those six into their motives into what kind of criminal activity they are involved in beyond um blood farming and why and who are they connected to and we've also expanded out into what we've, we're calling rising blood syndicates these are smaller groups or gangs that are trying to create their own territories and um or you know pushing muscling in on 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 other syndicates um what we've also done for taking a sort of a, a lead from what we did it with neo munich in hardware 2119 is in evolution by design we've included a map of the outer fringe so of, of western western france and uh, that runs from just west of paris all the way up to the metropolis boundary wall and we detailed um on that map like what area each syndicate holds um and we've detailed certain landmarks within that area which are important to those blood syndicates and why and we've talked about um, where some of those pipelines run through the old subway tunnels and how vampires move in and out of the outer fringe to the wider metropolis all the way over as far as berlin and beyond and um there's been a really great opportunity to do that not only to flesh out the blood syndicates as being you know alongside guy in the police force as being the big threat in the world but also to be able to give visual reference to people you know really understand how big these organizations are and where they where you can find them or or where you can hide from them and um so yeah this book we've gone into quite a lot of detail on that the blood syndicates are a really major player one in particular um he got a piece of art in the core book and he was mentioned um a a norl vampire which are the big Mm -hmm. mutated ones called goran tali Mm -hmm. and we've mentioned him a few times in fiction and we, uh, I say we had we had an image of him in the core book, and um, th- in this book we circle back to him and what's kind of been keeping him quiet. And there's a really pivotal um, uh, event that's happened in vampire history with the discovery of a third axiom of vampires, of which there is only one of, and it's currently in captivity in Gorantali's uh, pet, almost. And what that entity, known as the soul, represents has a large impact on the potential of the game's meta plot. Um, And um, so we talk a lot about him and his syndicate and his enemies and his allies and um, how those various uh, vampire threats may impact um games for games masters to roll them in and for players to be conscious of those threats um so yeah it's um i think it's pretty exciting stuff that i think a lot of people are going to really enjoy yeah now when we've we've already kind of dipped into a bit on the whole the whole rival ai thing now but i'd like to shift into some of the new rules that Evolution by Design is going to be adding in. Oh. Now, not specifically like like new abil- like new abilities for certain character archetypes, but more of new more of new rules that could be applied overall. Yeah. So the big one and the one which um you know through playtesting has been like just really 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 well received is the introduction of the most wanted status for 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 player teams so this is a tool for games masters 
to highlight how aware of a Merc team's activities, how aware the police are. With the implementation we mentioned earlier, there's a police drone network that's been um, implemented and the surveillance throughout the metropolis is rising. So we have a mechanic um, which, after any job, a, uh, a group of players will generate heat depending on what state they left that job in, whether it was against a high-profile target, whether they left dead bodies behind, whether they left footage, whether they had a failed hack and they um, triggered the um, the sort of uh, internet watchdogs. Like, the better things go, the less heat there is and the worse things go, or if they're messy, the more heat there is. And at the end of a game... Um, players will make a roll to see if they're able to mitigate any of that heat and before making that roll they can commit a quite a significant sum of money to pay off people or to help people cover up and if they are successful in mitigating the heat then their most wanted status will stay where it is if they fail in mit uh, to mitigate all the heat then their most wanted status will go up by one level and it, it goes from 1 to 10. And when you're in the first three ranks, there's no impact on the game. And once you hit rank 4 upwards, an increasing um, a number of penalties are applied to the team. And they're things like um, not being able to tap into your allies, prices of black market goods going up when you try and buy things, various activist groups refusing to work with you. So your life and work as a professional freelance merc becomes increasingly difficult the more that the police are on to you and then there's rules for you know kind of like abandoning your base of operations and starting over and dropping all that heat and like you know like rolling that into the story of your campaign you know like needing to get off grid and stuff like that so there's um there's been included in a couple of pages on how to roll this into your games and how to use it and there's a, a tracker the, almost like a character sheet for the GM for to allow them to track allies and enemies and the heat, the most wanted status and the amount of heat that uh, a, a crew has, has cooked up. So that's forefront. That's one of our kind of like really shining lights for this um, for this book um, that's been really well received. Um, we also have introduced rules for uh, information broking. So uh, up to now, you know, it's a it's a skill role to see if you can barter with somebody. But we had a bit of feedback that GMs weren't really sure off the back of a successful or unsuccessful bartering where to necessarily always go with things. Um, uh, information buying and selling is a really big part of the world. And so we have a kind of like quick, quick and dirty way to do it with a number of uh, random tables. Mm -hmm. So if a, um, if a barter skill test is, is successful, um, you roll on the various tables and you can uh, apply a plus or minus modifier to give you a better choice of the options. And if you fail, then um, you're stuck with the result you roll. And there's a, a role for the economics, a role for any complications or repercussions. And then if you're dealing with certain organizations, there's another role and you piece together the information to get the outcome deal of buying or selling information. Um, and it just makes life really quick. Um it really is a pretty cool system to use mm -hmm. on the random table front another thing we've been asked for a few times is a data seed builder you know we we have a lot of data seeds a lot of these kind of one-shot adventures like available to people i think between all of our publications and our one dollar online releases there must be 25 mm -hmm. if not more adventures out there for people to play but we've included like a whole range of um, uh, of random tables in order to just get a spark going. So like who your client is, what the job is, where the location is, what the reward is, what the plot twist is. Um, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, you can have a real solid foundation to either uh, expand an existing game or just cook up a data seed. Um, so yeah, th they're, you know, alongside um, things like the 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 uh, extra additional vampiric abilities or bits and pieces for character classes and all the um, new gear and the um, AI subscription services. Mm -hmm. We have all of those aspects thrown in as well as, as we mentioned briefly earlier, 
the rules for turning human uh, player characters into vampiric chattels to work directly for the blood syndicates um, as well. So there's quite a it's quite a chunky amount of rules in there. I think the last twenty five thirty pages of the book of various rules and or data seeds um to plug into the game so there's a good amount of gaming content in the, in the book as well as the law yeah now with that in, with that in with that in mind since since the blood syndicate is brought up i'm would it be fair of me to assume that a few examples of blood syndicates will be brought up as far as who the who the major players in them are, who they like, who they have a shoot on site policy of, and what how, how their operation tends to go, is going to be present. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, we we go into a lot more detail of that with that with Goran Tarly's syndicate, which we we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But all of the big big boys, we talk about what their motivations are, what they're where they're operating, why they're operating, and why they're doing it. We also include in the rules chapter, we have a, a section on um, on blood trade transactions. So you can actually get an, an idea of how much the various syndicates will pay for quality specimens or for quantities of very specific um, blood types. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we list all the various blood types and the, the percentage of the population that holds them in New Europe and, and how much... The various syndicates are prepared to pay if you are uh, despicable enough to want to sell your uh, fellow friends out that have rare blood types. Uh, and we do, um, th there's rules for introducing uh, complications and stuff for dealing with the vampires, which inevitably those deals don't often go very well. Um, but yeah, in the, in, the, in the background of the law, we talk a lot about um, what the motivations are of each of those syndicates and, you know, what players can do to get on their good side and you know, you understand which ones they should avoid at all costs. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a lot of detail between the rules and the vampire chapter. Um, players are going to, and, and GMs are going to leave reading this book with a really clear understanding of, what the blood syndicates are, what the blood war looks like, where it's taking place. Uh, we haven't really left many stones unturned where where the where the syndicates and the blood war is concerned. Mm -hmm. So, so with that in, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? So uh, we've um, the majority of content has been completed now. Um, we went to Kickstarter with 116 pages, um, but we've unlocked a bunch of data seeds from guest writers and, uh, and a couple of additional pages, which I've already almost completed writing over the last fortnight since those stretch goals were unlocked. Um, I put a hard cap on 128 pages. Um, that avoids, uh, a rising, uh, manufacturing costs too much and also avoids what I'm, I'm very keen on going to Kickstarter with a 95% completed book and going to print very soon after a manufacturing soon. I don't like people to be waiting around a long time for my product. So 128 pages is my, is my perfect. I think at the moment we're on something like 122. Um, so it's feeling viable that all of the additional content would get unlocked. Um, and then we have a couple of other guest writers that will be cooking up um, data seed adventures for us over the next couple of weeks and um, a, a little bit more another piece of full page art hopefully as well to um, you know like it's always great to be able to include those larger illustrations they are quite hard to get in budget wise but if stretch goals allow it's, it's great to be able to commission them so all being well this is going to go to print at 128 pages mm. um if not, it it will be slightly lower and, and some content, um, notably additional data seed adventures, um, you know, may not happen. But I'm I'm feeling very confident that we're going to um, we're going to get to the end of the stretch goals before the end of this campaign. Um, so yeah, and that that will make it basically the same size. 
as hardware twenty one nineteen, which I think was a you know a really good sized uh, supplement. Mm -hmm. And when when it comes to a release window, what do you th what are you thinking it's going to be? Uh, I'm really positive that I'm. Listen, the, the campaign ends on March the first. Um, at that point, I'm hoping, with the exception of any late unlock stretch goals, our content will be complete. I would think we need a couple of weeks to complete the writing, editing, proofing, and layout of uh, the remaining pages of content. And at that point, there will be a little bit more artwork to do. So we have our um, Merc Handler pledge tier, which allows backers to not only pick up the books, but also have uh, Jesus, our lead artist, do a piece of custom artwork in their likeness. Um, we've done this for all of our books. It's been really, really popular. Um, we have sort of five backers in the core book and three in Hardware 2119. And there are three slots for this book as well. Uh, one of those slots has already been claimed. There's two still up for grabs. Uh, and obviously we can't start on that artwork until the campaign has ended and the pledges have been collected and we know that those those backers have, um, you know, have followed through with, with, with backing us at that level. So um, those pieces of art can take anywhere from, you know, a few days to a week or more, depending on the complexity of them. Um, but I'm hopeful to be going to print with uh, this book in uh, April, mm -hmm. which means I could hopefully have them in hand by late May. So I would think the first backers are going to start to see these in June, July. Um, so again, ahead of schedule like I was last time. Uh, US backers will have to wait a little longer uh, because the only way I can offer the really competitive shipping rates to the US is to put the stock on a pallet and move that pallet by sea freight to the US and then have it distributed from within the US. It allows me to offer backers in the US for postage from the UK for as low as sort of 10 or 12 pounds, um, which compared to, you know, sending it airmail is a quarter of the price at the moment. Postage to the US is astronomical from the UK at the moment. Um, but I'm hopeful that we will start fulfilling um, uh, by the end of June. Um, so I think I estimated August on the campaign, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, I would think that all backers globally would have their pledges in hand before that uh, point in time. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can certainly get that. And I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Every time. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>